Okay, so I started um, working with Cow Tipping Press um, my, the winter of my first year at McAllister College. We have a department called the Civic Engagement Center and they arrange a lot of um, volunteer and work opportunities outside the campus community and one day there was a very very specific email that was focused on this one thing which was cow tipping. Um, it said something about um, social justice and literature and also something with 90 some percent of teachers say they had fun on the job. So I was like, that's an interesting combination of things. And um, I pulled up some of the electronic versions of the books that Cow Dipping Press had published and was super excited. I was going, whoa, 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 while I was reading them and I was at work, so it was kind of weird. But um, what caught me about the books was um, the amount of um, adherence to and deviation from standard English and standard grammar. Um, that's something that I really became interested in when I took a class through the University of Minnesota's College in the Schools program. And I read an article by a professor named Bell Hooks. It was called Teaching to Transgress. And an argument she made was that um, we shouldn't force individuals to adhere to standard English when writing. Um, it, like, it stifles the authenticity of their voices. And that just changed my mind about so many things because I've always been a big fan of like English literature and academic writing. So just to think that it is kind of counter to the purpose of academic study to say you have to follow these rules and not others. Um, so that really kind of was really exciting to see cow tipping stuff because it was sort of these conceptual things actually like in action, like in place. So I immediately started working on my application and um, yeah, then I started teaching. I taught a micro class, which is a two week, two session class. And then this summer I did a full five week class. And now um, I'm, as a part of my degree, my major at McAllister, I'm doing an internship for credit. So um, I reached out to Cow Tipping to see if I could keep, keep working with them to really be involved in what they do on kind of a different end. Um, and yeah, that's how I got here. So, can you say just a little about bit about your the your interests in literature and the kinds of questions that brought you to McAllister? Okay. Or that you developed as you studied at McAllister? Um, a lot of the um, interests I had were always kind of like found like foundational to like kind of like the traditional canon. Um, so Austin with like the creation of the novel was always one of my like biggest like interest areas um, and kind of like the feminist commentary that kind of comes and goes like with like getting into a more like romantic era with um, um, like Jane Eyre and other works like that. Um, seeing what kind of is mainstream and how that will fall by the wayside later. Um, it was during my senior year that I really kind of branched out more um, with the same University of Minnesota class um, looking at ideas like post-colonial um, theory and other things like that and that was when I really um, kind of broadened more with what I'm interested in like um, um, reading books by Toni Morrison and a variety of um, Native American authors too was really exciting. Um, it definitely kind of informed my interest in American studies when I kind of came to realize that looking at the body of American literature is more than Mark Twain. Um, so works we read like um, um, Ceremony, um, Green Grass, Running Water, um, variety of Sherman Alexie. 
So that was a kind of a combination of like my um, 11th grade and 12th grade English. And then um, since coming to McAllister, I've delved into writing more. I'm currently on the creative writing track. Um, and I think the same the same interests are still present. Um, yeah, definitely. I'm still interested in kind of looking at like diversifying the the canon that we read. Some of that's come with looking for more um, like independent publishers when I go to read for fun rather than like New York Times bestsellers, which is easy to kind of get caught up in. Um, and. Yeah, the, the courses that I'm the most interested in are ones that fall into um, a category we have, which is um, writers of color in the diaspora, something along those lines. Um, it's kind of, again, like diversifying the canon that many people read in like kind of our sort of like academic circle at school. And... Yeah, definitely, like, with writing as well, um, especially kind of creative nonfiction. G. E. Moore was asked once if he, if he read novels, and he said, yes, all six every year. <laughs> <laughs> and by that he meant, of course, Jane Austen. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, yes, I read novels, all of them, <laughs> yearly. <laughs> but... Uh, I mean the the subtext or whatever of that is that after you've read these things you can't read other stuff and take it very seriously <laughs> uh, and I mean a few people feel that way about all sorts of things that they just set a standard of excellence and I mean you started out reading re you know stuff that's centrally regarded yeah. And has been for, you know, 100 years regarded as a model. Mm -hmm. What's happened to your, what's happened to your elitism? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I think it has to do with, like, reading, like, academic texts surrounding the books I've read. Like, I know, um, like, the idea that before... Before Austin, novels were like novels, like they weren't they weren't the same. Were much more fantastical and unrelatable, and he really kind of paved a new road with making it very relatable to at least a lot more people than they once were before. It wasn't fantastical pirates like kidnapping people and things <laughs> like this, um, and then. It's weird because later with Jane Eyre, um, Charlotte Bronte was criticized for not writing like Austen. So it's just kind of weird how like standards kind of come and go. And I think my response to that is then like let's kind of just not have them then. And not to say that like things that have followed are like of any less value, even though that's very much like a kind of like a, a relative, hard to, like, I don't know, I feel like it's a fallacy to really say, like, this is valuable and this isn't. But, um, yeah, I think it's definitely kind of seeing how things have changed. Um, and I know something that stuck with me was um, from an NPR podcast, um, I think, I think it was Fresh Air, the one with all the interviews. Um, they were talking about um, how The Great Gatsby has kept its relevance more than other works from the, from the time, like Hemingway. Um, and they compared Gatsby to like the MTV series Cribs. And how like it's kind of the same thing, it's just sort of being presented in a different way. Um, so I guess that's kind of ultimately what I think makes something meaningful, and yeah, I know like there are, there are works of literature, like I know like Pilgrim's Progress is like 
touted as like the most boring of things and kind of all these like different um like perceptions that influence what people decide to read some are like problematic and some i think just reflect just like kind of an innate inability to like relate to things after a certain period of time has passed from their creation but i don't know i just think it's just kind of not not being narrow, I think, is ultimately more valuable. Um, it's like um, something I think about with uh, contemporary art. When people are highly critical of contemporary art, I wonder if they are just thinking, oh, I don't want this in my living room, so therefore I don't like it. <laughs> um, and yeah, I think everything, it, it has value and you don't want to try to derive so much that you treat it like it's the only thing that's out there because then you're not looking for everything else. Um, so kind of realizing there's no like best because that's bad for you and that's like bad for the artistic community if you kind of narrow. So that's something I always try to think about. I used to accuse my friends in literature and philosophy at Carleton of having so much respect for the books they were studying that after they left the university they would no longer read them. <laughs> 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 you know, it's like without the sacred priesthood of, yeah. of, uh, of people, uh, you know, to initiate us properly and without the, you know, without all of that fruit fra you know, just don't feel up to opening these books. Yeah, and, yeah. And, of course, that's, that's ultimately, it's a joke, and it's also ultimately a condemnation of, of a kind of education. If, if, if people don't read after they leave your literature courses for whatever reason, mm -hmm. uh, you failed. Yeah. <laughs> <I know. laughs> so, what kind of a reader are you? I mean, I mean, not not yeah. in the courses, but in the summer. <laughs> yeah, in the summer. Um, I think classics, originally very much like English language classics, um, were kind of like the road I followed. Um, and like trying to diversify that. Um, picking up things that I've heard about through school, like... During winter break, I read 100 Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez, which was really exciting. Um, and also, like, it's fun to read translations, even just because, like, thinking about, like, the politics of it and what it might be saying that you don't want to say, that, that wasn't, like, originally intended to be said. Um, and also reading um, more from independent presses like um, Coffee House and Milkweed, I've been a really big fan of a recent book from Milkweed um, called Braiding Sweetgrass, which is really exciting. It's a really um, unique book. I've never, it's all these ideas that I've never heard anywhere else and they're all in this one book and it's very exciting. Um, and yeah, I'm kind of looking more at definitely like 20th century literature rather than um like kind of like Victorian and like around like Regency um in English language um like Mar Margaret Atwood has definitely um become one of my favorites and um kind of like looking at like the relevance especially with Handmaid's Tale being made into a series um and hmm yeah i definitely in like novels and nonfiction. um i haven't read much poetry that's definitely something i kind of often leave untouched um because it's something i'm just not as familiar with so i'm less inclined to read it but i feel like it's just like for many reasons i should give it more like more consideration. Yeah. So, what's your what's your 
tell me about your experience at Cow Tipping Press and about what that teaching was like okay. for you. So, okay. Yeah, um, when I first started um, in the spring semester, um, I really super, I wasn't sure what to expect. Um, something we do a lot of is we um, create, we have excerpts and other short readings that inspire prompts in class. So like I'll have a couple um, like memoirs for creative nonfiction and a couple poems for poetry. And choosing those was always hard. Um, just because of like, we, we would read them together in class and um, making things, the balance between having stuff be like open-ended and having it kind of focused with a clear direction of, oh, like this is a poem about like mac and cheese. So it was kind of like balancing those things and I wasn't always sure where, um, where they would go. And also um, knowing how long it would take for students to write and it's kind of like the logistics that was very, very focused on those things. And then um, walking into my first class was super exciting because there were a ton of volunteers and support staff there with the maybe five or six students. And um, there was just so much energy and it was really great because all these like staff and volunteers and all the students knew each other really, really well. And they were really happy to be there and um, just to kind of like share ideas and like things they're thinking about. Um, like I know like I kept, kept finding myself saying, oh, this is something you could write about. This is something you could bring in. And um, I think the coolest thing um, in that class was um, we watched a video of, uh, it was TED, it might have been a TEDx performance of a slam poem called If If I Should Have a Daughter, I think it was. Um, and from watching that, we kind of generated this idea of writing letters or like kind of giving wisdom to other people. And kind of like, it's hard to kind of like talk about like what is slam poetry. Um, and I think the thing about it that really stuck was um, Kind of this like and like bursting energetic language that's very expressive and everyone was very in, like engaged and I had people share who hadn't wanted to talk yet and that was really fun that was super exciting um and, yeah, and then um this summer was also really great having the five weeks so we could um, look at a wider variety of pieces and um, we had the amazing opportunity to be at the show gallery with um, Midwest Special Services, that's where the students were from, and um, having the gallery space was really cool because um, we spent a day doing journalism and one of the exercises we did was um, like doing an art review or an art critique. So everyone walked around and looked at stuff. And it was really fun just because um, like I would watch students like look at a thing and then pull aside a volunteer and say, this is why this is so great. And they had so much to say and would pour it and went and poured it all out. Um, Cause I know some students, they were kind of reluctant to go into a lot of detail, um, so kind of like trying new things with um, writing longer pieces wasn't going as well, but with that exercise it really like, was, there were a lot of sparks happening which was cool. And then um, also seeing when um, students were very um, adamant about not following the prompt, which some, was something I was a little too um, attached to at first and I kind of changed my mind about it when I talked to Brian, the director, because when he started out um, creating cow tipping, he would only sit down with people and say, what do you want to say? And that was where they went, like it was just from like what the students brought into the room. So I definitely tried to incorporate that more 
and um, again like kind of improving the balance between like the ambiguous and the specific. Um, I know for, for a few students they really liked something where um, I would have a word on an index card and it'd be something like happy or storm or night and that would lead to something really cool. Um, cause it's, also, it's very specific but it's also very kind of general. Um, yeah, and just like the genuine um, expressions of I like this, I don't like this made it really um, unpredictable but also very um, fulfilling to see when people really found their niche. And yeah, and kind of like the steps along the way with how we would write, like sometimes people would write themselves, sometimes the support staff or volunteer would transcribe. And sometimes we would do audio recordings and yeah it was just really fun to kind of change change up the medium I know like people would like there was a lot of um, like kind of like satisfaction that I could see when people would like have a recording made and they would play it back for everyone to listen to um, cause it's like speaking in front of an audience but not actually doing it and yeah, like just changing, like the opportunities to kind of change things up to like experiment and to kind of add to a body of work that is very new. Um, yeah, like kind of seeing all this like progress and like cool creativity happening in person and being able to kind of guide it was really exciting. So what does it take to be a teacher? Or what kind of a role or do you do you fall, do you find what feel more most comfortable with as a leader in this particular kind of, of workshop teaching situation? Um, I think my my biggest thing, and I realized this after my first class, was the better word is facilitator, um, just because. It's kind of the, the purpose behind what we do is um, amplifying the voices of people with developmental disability um, and really kind of like bringing those out rather than really like directing anyone. Um, and with prompts and with um, example, like example readings and with questions, um, it it really is just to kind of like spur ideas. It's not to say, oh, model this. Like some people like to do that and like if they want to, it's okay. But there's no one way to take something or one way to respond. Um, I think it's really cool when people um, take a, they see a prompt or an idea and they say, oh, I don't want to do this, but I want to do this. And having that, that kind of process of inspiration take place is really um, really cool um, so I think kind of knowing that what you put into it as a teacher is important but it's not at all about you and necessarily about what you're bringing as long as like what you bring means something to you um, like I know talking with other teachers when they've taught genres they're not as interested in the whole class kind of can tell. Um, it, like the energy level falls and students aren't as eager to write. Um, yeah, and I, th I think something that's important is um, like having a lot of like energy about, about people and about um, watching them and helping them um, kind of explore things they're interested in. And also, it's kind of like a innate like love of words and writing too. Um, so I I found that um, people people write a lot. Like there's the classes are have maybe around six people. It can it can vary, but people are writing a lot, and you're hearing things performed. And like I would take stuff home and type it up, and bring stuff back to students and. So a lot, a lot was coming through and it was a big eye-opener to what it means to teach. Um, but being able to 
really listen to students when they read or when they ask questions or share ideas and to give authentic feedback on the spot. Um, it's hard, but I think it's very important um, to let people know that you really um, listen to what they said and um, being authentic about this is something that I think is really great and um, I, I think that was really important um, something talking about with something I've talked about with um, cow tipping and people we've worked with is um, in kind of like areas where um, areas where people are work like neurotypical people are working with people with developmental disabilities there's often not as much of an arts focus, it's more of a craft focus. Um, not so much of like self-directed, like original creative work, but kind of working within a, like a, a very set template, I guess how I understand it. Um, yeah, so I think just being supportive at all times um, and really seeing people as artists and willing a willingness to um, Kind of like look beyond your experiences or kind of understanding and yeah it, it ends up being much more of an exchange than a, like a teacher student relationship how do you think about the matter of, of shaping work the process of revision Flannery O'Connor famously said something like, yeah, squelching beginning writers so they never write again. That's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah. proud of it. You know, basically, I'm proud of the people who I <laughs> kept from continuing. And you can see what that means. If, if it, but on the other hand, you're, you're after something quite different not dealing with people who are going to kill a million trees with something that ultimately is not going to work. Uh, how do you see your job, how do you see what you do, I won't say critically, but in, 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 in helping with the revision process in your situation? Yeah, it's, it's funny because that's really not a big thing we do. Um, and like in in each class, um, people ideally write maybe three or four pieces, and um, we teachers and staff, support staff and volunteers um, try to kind of keep them going as much as they can. So it's almost very much like a pr producing a lot or as much as possible is always mm -hmm. the goal. If someone wants to keep working on one thing, they can keep working on it or else if they're done quickly moving on to something else, so just kind of keeping keeping the pencils moving. And um, revisions aren't, um, they're, they're more um, pre kind of preparing for um, the publications we do for each class. And that's usually, it involves a teacher kind of thinking about formatting, like, um, putting stuff in kind of more of like a prose form or kind of breaking it up into stanzas. Um, sometimes making, it's a, a balance between um, kind of making some like grammatical adjustments. Um, and the, the idea is balancing, um, keeping the authentic voice of the writer and then making it um, more something that a broader audience would be able to kind of take stuff away from and understand um, and then with those changes I would make those changes and kind of put together like a packet of edited adjusted stuff and then talk with the student to see what they think and what things they want ultimately for the book where each person has maybe four, four or five um, pieces and um, yeah, so students will sometimes take, keep, hold on to stuff, um, 
and sometimes bring it back after adding more, sometimes not. And yeah, it's really to in inspire people to like keep writing and to kind of do more, especially because we're not like, we don't have this like um, super set curriculum where this is going to like make you like a quote unquote better writer or like change how you do this or it's really kind of I understand it as a means of kind of helping people like look inward and say oh I have these abilities I can do this I can write really original cool creative things that like reflect my experience or interests and that's something that's like coming from them and not us um, so like in my classes I just hope to help people find that and then once the class is done, then, like, just have fun with it, um, like, take more classes, um, we try to connect people with, like, other kind of opportunities, um, whether or not designed for people with developmental disabilities or not, um, if they're interested in it, but, um, yeah, I saw this as kind of, like, a push to, like, do more and to write more and I guess if someone wants to go back and change their writing in any big way it's always very much their call um, and yeah it's a pretty open-ended process. Has there been any spillover from your experience at cow tipping to your own writing? Um. I know um, it it's hard to really separate it all because I was doing I was taking a creative writing class where I was learning a ton of new stuff just like while learning a ton of new stuff um, with cow tipping but I think something that I've taken away um, is kind of like a a blending of kind of um, content and then like the means of presenting it. Um, sometimes students would have um, a very like heartwarming, very relatable story, but it would be written in a way that many people would be kind of unfamiliar with. Um, so kind of like in like things that feel more relatable and things that feel more experimental and kind of like mixing the two has like intrigued me a lot. Um, yes, and also like there's been, I've, um, ways in which people relate genres to, um, current events like um, looking at like politics and like bringing in science fiction kind of ideas is um, definitely really interesting because I've had several students who um, they like to write about real life and um, that was something that I kind of had to like come to terms with when presenting genres, especially doing fantasy writing, because a lot of students didn't want to bring in fictional stuff into their pieces, and instead would um, reflect ideas like um, time travel um, in terms of looking at like the length of their life, and like if I travel back in time to when I was a little kid or into the future, and yeah, it, it almost kind of like co like collapses the genre, and not something that has really influenced influenced me because I'm also a very re realistic writer, but it's something that I've definitely kept in mind. There's a standard piece of advice for writers. You you find it on the Facebook advice for writers things all the time, which is that if you want to become a writer, read. 
Does it work that way for people with developmental disabilities? I mean, are they reading and getting ideas from what they read and trying things out that they find and things they read? How does it, how does it work in that case? I mean, I'm, I'm sure it varies a lot. Um, I know in, in my experience, um, doing readings in class um, didn't go, it didn't engage people too much. Um, finding stuff with like, like the, like nature of a text so that like it's easily understood um, is kind of a tricky thing to balance. Um, but yeah, it, it's, I think, um, kind of like looking at like broader, broader ideas for, um, like what is a text and what is a work, like a, like a piece of work, like how confined is it to like a book on a, like a page of a book because, um, like there are so many kind of stories and narratives that, um, like students I've had are really familiar with and like they're the same stories and narratives that like any like neurotypical person out in the community would probably be aware of um like a lot of fans of like certain kinds of music or of harry potter or things like that where um people are really excited about it and energetic and very familiar with like all the caveats and like details of these stories and are eager are eager to write about them and reflect them in their work, whether or not we like busted out a Harry Potter book and like read a read a passage together. Um, so I I think um, kind of like in in those ways, um, people bring in a lot of stuff, um, like a lot of stuff from movies. But I know that was one thing that re reading stuff as a group wasn't a huge thing. Um, sometimes students would like look ahead in packets and like find things they liked and they would bring them in or like ideas from them but I found that um, prompts like questions or one word prompts or other kind of like di like varying media like videos or images um, usually were more more like effective starting point but kind of from my perspective and time with students it was kind of hard to tell like I don't really know like what everyone's doing in their time outside of class like if they are interested in reading or if they've kind of decided against it or if they haven't had the opportunity to really find something that they're interested in but yeah so I guess it's kind of it's kind of open. I'm not really sure where everyone's coming from. You brought some books along. Yeah. Uh, want to want to say anything about those? Yeah. Um. Yeah. These are. This is from. This was a publication from kind of like winter and spring. And this is a publication from my class this summer and um yeah it it um the setup of the books is kind of like sort of like a typical like anthology it's pretty short um each student has around three pieces um something that's really exciting in this book that I'm not sure if anyone has done before was um when we wrote um, pieces of like, we did like art review and art criticism, um, there was a student who um, was incredibly excited about one picture and his piece is really great and I wasn't sure if it was, like it would, it gives it so much more to like have the image with it. Um, so, I contacted um, Midwest Special Services and like the people who work there at the gallery to see if we could 
like have the artist's permission to like bring their photo in to the book and they were okay with it. So um, there's a piece printed alongside um, an image, which is really fun. Um, Would you like to read it? Sure. Um, okay, the piece is called Merry Christmas. Um, I saw pictures, it feels like Christmas, and we can't see what's going on, but it's fun to pray out there, and I can't how to see fog. It feels like art, and it's so detailed with joy, and brings you a lot of laughter, and it brings you out into the, the community. Peace on earth and goodwill. Tiding. Temperature. The sun comes out and melts the fog. Why don't you, if you could hold up the picture so we can see what that is looking like. Thank you. Yeah. Any other favorites you'd like to read? Or um, just, just pieces that, that that you would like to talk about? Oh, okay. Um, one that was really fun. Um, there's a form poem that I learned about um, in my creative writing class called A Huzzle. It's um, from kind of the Middle East. And... Um, it, it's pretty simple. Um, it's a series of couplets that have, like, the last word of the last line of each couplet is the same, um, more or less the same, and um, I did it with my first class, and it kind of took a while because it's not something most people are familiar with, but just the idea of, like, a repeating thing or, like, something, repeating something that's important to you stuck and a lot of people went with it and someone did that in in class and um he even brought in some, like some things that he overheard that day that he thought were fun um and things from an example I came up with like his repeating word is um the one I used for the example I gave in class so it just kind of really shows this, like, student's interest in, um, like, drawing from everything. Like, from, like, things on a page, from things someone said, from things you overheard that weren't even necessarily meant to directly influence the writing. It was just something he heard. Um, and, yeah, I can read this one. It's untitled. Um, oh my Atlanta, someone ate the plate of cake, no one is looking cake. My brother and me like to eat cake. I went to the store and bought some cake for the holiday to celebrate John F. Kennedy. Cake, 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 cake. 